going and we'll get started. Okay. Hello, beautiful women. Welcome. Um, I'm so excited to have you here today. If you have been following anything that I've been doing lately, I have a bit of a, a passion for this subject that we're talking about today. And um, some of you will have heard this story, but I'm going to do a quick recap because some of you will not have heard the story. So from 32 to 42, I was unwell and in a deep healing journey. I've learned, I learned a lot about um, healing from that journey. I am grateful for it. It helps me immensely in my work. However, when I uh, started heading into the perimenopausal years, I didn't really understand. I thought you you would know that you were in perimenopause when your period started going irregular. And I'm a medical professional, right? So I've taken lots of courses on hormones and Chinese medicine is really, really, really big on, uh, you know, women's hormones, right? Because they're really big into fertility. And so they have a lot of information about perimenopause and all of that. Well, I thought a lot of information about it until I started going through it myself. So when I was 45, I um, met my amazing husband. Um, life was really good. At that point, I was feeling healthier than I had been in many, many years. I'd finally put on some weight. I was always underweight. So I'd finally put on some weight, but I had this one digestive thing that wasn't quite going away. And so one of my practitioners and mentors who lives in uh, Ithaca, New York said, why don't you come here this summer see me and then you can go to this detox center that I love and you can do a detox. Now, I'm not a big one on, on drastic detoxes and I'm particularly not a big one now on drastic detoxes during this time, as you will hear. But I, I thought, wow, everybody talks about these drastic detoxes. I call them enema camps. You go and you eat very little and you drink lots of liquids and you stick wheatgrass in every orifice of your body. And it's supposed to do great things for you. And you're supposed to feel great and all of this. And I never done, he had just suggested before, but I never did it before because I was just too thin and I couldn't afford to lose the weight. So I went to this drastic detox. It was a nightmare for me. I was a physical mess. I lost 10 pounds, which I did not need to lose. And by by the time I got on the airplane to go home, I had my first panic attack, which led to a phobia of flying, which led to a phobia of small spaces, which led to a difficulty getting into airplanes. And I mean, airplanes and uh, parking garages. Like I couldn't drive into a parking garage. My poor husband at the time was like, okay, he was so great in holding it for me. But I was like, what is going on? I thought that I had been exposed to gluten through the wheatgrass, which was true, I had, but that had just wreaked the havoc in my brain and why I was experiencing these, these phobias that I'd never had in my life before. I remember we were, I was heading to a therapy session um, and I walked into the door, it was a new person, and I walked into the door and then you had to turn and go down the hallway and then you had to turn. And through that process, there were no windows or doors, like you saw nothing. And I walked in and I like, oh, and I had to turn around and walk out. I almost wasn't able to go into the session. I had to talk myself off a ledge to get myself into the room, right? So quite truthfully, it wasn't until one of my clients came in and she said to me, oh my gosh, I'm having these phobias and I can't get into the backseat of a car and I can't small spaces and parking garages that I was like, and she goes, I looked it up online and this can be a symptom of perimenopause. And I was like, what? I had no idea. So I was like, okay, wait a second. If I don't know, a lot of other people don't know. And so I started deep diving into this whole experience that women were having and trying to understand it, trying to figure out what the heck was going on. And I joined those Facebook book groups. Any of you guys uh, belong to one of those? <laughs> Where women go in and they just tell these horrible stories about these terrible symptoms they're having. And you're not allowed to offer support. You're not allowed to say anything. So I would give them sort of some vague recommendations, but my heart was breaking. So I was like, oh my gosh, we have got to change this. Then I'm happy to say I don't have any of those symptoms. Okay, I'm fine now. Um, it was about took me about six months to get that brain rebalanced back out. But that was a direct result of throwing my body into an extreme stress, stress state, as you're going to hear, which is not what we want to do during this time. And that throwing my hormones off and that dysregulating my brain. And the story continues from there. Right. 
So I was like, you know what, this, this has to change. We have to change this, the information that's out there. Women have to know that there's solutions. This isn't okay. And, but I wasn't kind of really, I was, I was thinking about it, but I wasn't really doing anything about it until I went to a lecture um, at a functional medicine group with this woman who was considered the, the hormone guru. And um, she was, you know, the one, she'd written a book and everyone was so excited to have her there. And I sat in the chair a few rows back and she stood in front of the room and she said, from a biological perspective and anthropological perspective, women are done post childbearing years. And I was like, what? <laughs> and she said, thereby, and then she gave all the research of what happens to your body if you have low estrogen. And she said, thereby, the kindest thing that you can do is keep yourself on hormones and bleeding until you're into your 70s and 80s. And I was like, whoa, 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 wait, whoa, 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 whoa. I found that really, really upsetting because nothing could be further from the truth. Now, I am not saying that some women will not need a little bit of hormone replacement, depending on how out of balance the body is. Look at, I am on a little bit of hormone replacement, but does everybody need hormone replacement? Julie, no, everybody does not. Most women don't, depending on how, how well their body can handle the, the, the basic stress of life. My body was coming off of a very long prolonged illness, right? That prolonged illness, then I was thrown into a very acute stress state that threw my body into a vicious cycle of stress that we're going to talk about. And I couldn't get my head above water. So a little bit of hormone replacement helped me. That said, hormone replacement comes at a cost and not everybody can use it, right? And so we got, we have to be very judicious about it and we don't want to use it as the only solution if we are going to use it. We want to be looking at the bigger picture because the thing that is, excuse me, <clears throat> throwing your hormones off is throwing your body off in many, many other ways. And if we don't handle that, your body continues to go into that degenerative cycle with a band-aid that's making you feel a little bit better. Does that make sense? So I can't say to you, should you or not, that's really individualized in the sense of, can we get your body balanced out without it? To me, that's optimal, okay? I am not of the school that thinks nature screwed up and we've got it wrong. I'm of the school that nature did it beautifully right our lifestyle is out of balance and it's really, really taxing our systems. That tax on our systems is causing this time to be really, really uncomfortable for many people, okay? For many women. In, um, I haven't looked at the new statistics, but there used to be something like 15% of people, women in Asia had perimenopausal syndrome at all. In, in, in European countries, it was like 70% right? So obviously lifestyle's got something to do with it. And, you know, we don't live, a, a, you know, one of the, there's been many things that have not been great about COVID, but one of the things that's been really great for many people, not everybody, but many people has created a better work-life balance. We're not rushing, rushing, rushing around, you know, zooming over here, going over there, doing this, doing that. Some people it's created a much less um, uh, balance because they're on Zoom from, you know, eight in the morning until eight at night, nonstop. But the, 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 this phase of life, what, what's happening is we are fundamentally shifting. So I'm gonna tell you one other piece to that story that really got the fire under my booty and got me, you know, out there starting to talk about this stuff was um, that that same group reached out to me and said, hey, we've got, you know, so and so doctor coming back. Do you want to show up? And I wrote back and I said, quite honestly, I find her a bit offensive that she stands up there and says that, you know, women are done post menopause and that we have to artificially keep them bleeding until their 80s. A, I don't think that's healthy. And B, that's just not true. And um, and he, he writes back, male doctor, and he writes back and says, uh, well, you know, nature can be cruel. Some species die after giving birth. I'm going to drink water on that one. I was like, excuse me? I wanted to say, yeah, and some species eat their mate after mating. <laughs> Are you kidding me? So what's happened from my viewpoint in, the, in our culture? Other cultures have this. 
but our culture does not, is there's three phases, major phases of a woman's life. It's not two and then the cliff into nothingness. There's three, okay? We are a child. We become fertile. When estradiol comes into our system, we become fertile. When estradiol decreases, a new hormone comes in. That new hormone is called estrone. It's always been there, but now it's dominant. Estradiol and estrone are fundamentally different. We are taking on a new role in our culture. And if we look back anthropologically, you know, from an anthropological perspective, that role was the wise woman, the healer, in some tribes, the tribal leader. It was anything but, you know, done, right? That's a really important role. It is the wise woman that teaches the tribe how to survive. And look at our, our, our world right now. Our wise woman has completely been decapitated in our culture and look what's happening in our world. There is nobody that is guiding this ship towards survival at the moment, right? So, you know, thank God what I'm seeing happening is that powerful women are starting to go through this change and go like, oh, wait, we got a problem here. And they're starting to want to talk about this and get this out there more. And we've got women um, at this stage of life that are powerful. And our role isn't to become more like a man and rule like a man. Our role is to embody the, the, our innate um, uh, uh, superpowers that we gain when we move from estradiol to estrone. So anybody who's had the uh, privilege of being a mommy knows that you have some superpowers, right? You are able to multitask like no tomorrow right? In most cases, we, you are able to know what your kid is doing in the other room while you're cooking dinner, while you're doing something over here, right? That superpower, when we move into a strone is no longer necessary. Okay. And so it starts to diminish, which is actually really helpful, but really disorienting. If a, you're still a, a mom to a, a young child, which many women are now because we're having babies so much later, right? Or and B, if that's what we value ourselves on. So I looked at a study and I should have looked at the numbers again, but it was like 46% of the women in the workplace that hit this phase of life feel like they, they're not doing as good at their job. And many of them feel like they need to quit or take a sabbatical. And it's like, no, 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 no. We're just new tools are coming online and we have to learn how to use them, right? Just like a little girl suddenly has a body, she has to learn how to navigate in and how awkward that is. And some people put on really big clothes and other people overshow it off. And we have to learn to navigate this new brain of ours because our brain shifts. We have to learn to navigate this new libido of ours because our libido changes. We have to learn to navigate the, the, this body of ours that wants to kind of put on weight, <laughs> you know, much more easily than it did. Or for some people lose weight, but that weight management becomes much trickier during this time. Yeah. So this is why we're here today, because I need you to know so that you can make sure your children know so that we can make sure this dialogue starts to shift. And I also need you guys knowing that you can feel better and helping you to do that so that um, you can start to claim this next phase. I, was, I had this beautiful um, moment. I was uh, at a, a gathering of uh, something called Association of Transformational Leaders. And there is this uh, woman there. She's a sannyasin and she just wrote a book. I love, uh, and she talked about it in the book. So I feel like I can share the story, but she wrote a book uh, called Himalaya, Hollywood to the Himalayas. Beautiful, beautiful book. And I had the great privilege of spending the weekend with her. And um, at one point we were talking about this menopause thing and Jonathan chimes in, he goes, tell him the title of what you're calling it. And I, I kind of hesitated because I sort of listened to what's the right thing at the right time. But he was like, so I said, a oh, wise woman emerging. And she said, well, quite truthfully, Kari, when I was having all those hot flashes, I could have cared less about my wise woman, right? And so here is a woman who is like fully embodying her wise woman. She's out in the world as a, I mean, that's her role, right? She is out in the world as a spiritual leader. And, and I agree. So we have to get you guys feeling balanced and good and oriented in where you're at 
so that you can really start to step into this next role. Because when we're not sleeping and we're, you know, if we're sweating and we have anxiety and all of this, we don't care about a wise one. We just care about surviving because it feels like we're not going to, right? You guys all with me? Okay, good. So we're going to start now with the one thing I will talk about in every call I do on these is stress because it's really important that you know that what happens during this phase is your ovaries were making estradiol. So you're a child, you go into childbearing years, it's because your ovaries came online and they started producing estradiol, okay? Now, at your ovary production estradiol is going down, you're not creating follicles as much anymore. One month, you'll create a follicle. You'll get enough progesterone. The next month, next month, you won't create a follicle. You won't get enough progesterone. So you're in this up and down phase that can be part of the process, not for everybody. My mother, zero symptoms. She just one day stopped bleeding and went on with life. Okay. That is not the majority of what I'm hearing and seeing because those ones that are doing that, you know, aren't talking about it, right? <laughs> so we can do up and go up and down and there is a, um, a normalness to it because of this, this, whether we have a follicle or we don't have a follicle that month, okay? How, and so when we understand that, it, it can be helpful for us. We can be like, okay, I'm having a little bit of an off month and you know, without creating a big story. That's one of the really important things to do is keep out of the story and the fear of it all, yeah? So um, when estro estradiol goes down, our adrenals make a hormone called androstenedione. Your body starts to make, convert androstenedione into a strone in, hello, fat cells. So when we're imbalanced, that belly fat increases partially because the body's trying to make more estrogen. It's actually trying to do a loving thing. So one of the most important things for us to learn to do in claiming our wise woman, but also in navigating this period is to really, really work to moderate our stress on all levels. Okay, because when the adrenals are co-opted and busy doing something else, they could care less about making hormone. They could care less about making immune cells. Does anybody want a good immune system right now? So they can care less about these things. What they care about is immediate survival. Okay, so one of the things that I talk a lot about is blood sugar regulation and why I'm not recommending intermittent fasting. If you want to do a 10, 14, I'm fine with that. But anything more than that, 10 eating, 14 off, I do not recommend it. Because when your blood sugar drops, unless you're eating a ketogenic diet and you're not relying on blood sugar, another, another topic, but when your blood sugar drops, most people are relying on, on blood sugar. You're only relying on ketones if you're kind of forcing your body to do that. You're putting yourself in a blood sugar starvation state and then your body goes to its backup system of burning ketones. Okay, when your blood sugar drops, stress hormones get produced to get your body to break down glucose stores and get them out there because it's an emergency. Well, stress hormones don't go, well, today I think I'm just going to release and get blood sugar to break down. And I won't stop the blood from going to my digestive organs and I won't shut down my immune system and I won't, shut, you know, it doesn't do that. You get stress hormones released in your body. Guess what? You're in a stress state. OK, so we have to learn to regulate that stress. Now, this is a vicious cycle because when the hormones go off, it's stressful <laughs> and then you get in this loop. Right. And so there is an art to getting out of the loop. But blood sugar regulation, any of you guys have worked with me, you've got my book. There's a little section in there. Um, you uh, in January, we're going to be dropping into a week long free course every day for a week where you guys get to come in, we're gonna be talking about managing weight. I will be dropping into blood sugar regulation again there uh, when I've got that up and running. And if you wanna sign up, I'll, I'll, I'll send you guys an email with the, with the link for that. Um, but blood sugar regulation, super, super, super important. Okay, so stop skipping meals, ladies, and stop making everybody else more important than keeping your adrenals 
balance because when your adrenals are off, guess what? So is everybody else's in the house. <laughs> you haven't noticed. <laughs> we do hold down the anchor. Yeah. But what we tend to do is we start to gain weight. So we start to like play with, our, you know, our eating and weird diets and stuff because we're trying to, you know, keep our weight balanced. And quite truthfully, it's one of the worst things that we can do. So I'm going to jump into weight since I was there and then I'll circle back to libido. But one of the things with weight, one of the things you don't want to do during this time is yo-yo dieting because um, the ups, you know, they don't come down. So, so your, your slinky gets really, really flexible on the gain and really rigid on the lose during this time. Now that's as a person, if you're having weight gain, some people don't, but so I'm speaking to the weight gain. Um, but so slinky gets really flexible on the, on the gain and not so flexible on the lose. So we have to be very careful in our, our cheat days that we do, right? Because it'll just sneak up. And then if you don't get that weight down within a few days, getting back into a regulated eating habit, you'll, you'll have a new set point. And getting that set point down becomes much harder at this phase of life. Okay. So what we're looking at now, most women who are having trouble keeping the weight, you've got to check out your stress. You've got to, we want to look at the hormones. We got to really do a deep dive, look into the thyroid. I am putting together a course that will start in January where we will do all of this together. So just know that that's coming. I'm not doing it now. Why? Because it's the holidays and you know, who, so no one wants to do it around this time. So, so, but, but, but in December, um, or actually in November, I'm going to do a, a, a one where we talk about the hormones and then I'm going to talk about how to navigate the holidays. So I won't spend too much time here when it gets closer. We'll talk about how to not go poof through the holidays. Um, but what you want to be doing is you, you gotta, every time I, most people I see around weight, it is the food choices they're making, not everybody, but many, many, many people, it is the food choices they're making. What one of the problems that happens during this time, one of the superpowers that we gain <laughs> during this time is that we stop caring so much because we used to, from a biological perspective, need to please a mate to get what we needed, which was procreation, right? That's our biological job during those years is procreating. So we, 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 we attract, want to attract and keep a mate, okay? That goes away. So our need to please our partner completely shifts. And if we were pleasing against ourselves in some way, shape, or form, it completely goes out the window. A lot of marriages really struggle during this time because we find our nose. Now, we can be a little grumpy in our nose, but we find our nose. However, what happens in and around weight is if our body regulator was our self-judgment that self-judgment can soften and now the control has been let off of the other emotional components that want to use food to self-soothe does that make sense and so during this time it's a really important time that we're really meeting those emotional components and we are um addressing them, those things that make us want to, you know, I'll tell you, I'm mean, honestly, I was away this weekend with my husband and his daughter and her partner for uh, camping. And it was very sweet. My husband, I wanted hot chocolate. He didn't bring any. So he took an entire chocolate bar and made me hot chocolate. It was so decadent. And I did that. And then I know I had some corn chips. And then I think I bought some chocolate covered almonds. I came home two pounds heavier. And this is a body that never could put on weight, right? And so our, our ability to, and we also weren't moving at all. We weren't exercising. So those two things combined, like not moving my body and having, you know, a chocolate bar for breakfast, um, <laughs> we're, we're more than my body could process. And so I gained two pounds. Now I got a window where I can get it back down by getting moving again and cleaning up my diet, getting the sugar back out and all of that. But if I don't, my new, wet, my new set point will be this new weight. Yeah. So, um, so with weight, you have to really watch that input and output, and you have to really watch the regulators. So the, the voices that used to regulate because I'm not going to be lovable, I'm not going to be enough, those ones might get softer, 
but we so, but we do really want to look at why we're making the choices we're making. And the truth is you may not be able to eat the same way that you used to eat and maintain your weight, especially if you are more sedentary. I used to work in an office and I'd get up and down all day long. I'm sitting on my tuchus all day long. I don't need the same amount of food that I needed when I was up and down and testing people and doing all this mobility, right? So now if you're a person who is, has, has the other problem where you tend to lose weight, that usually is an absorption issue. And where we wanna uh, be uh, aware of that is bone health, uh, as, uh, among other things. Because when estrogen starts to drop, if we're in a low estrogen state, because our system's under stress or for some other reason, then we are going to um, start to, to lose bone. And so we really want to make sure that we are absorbing properly. Yeah. That was why I didn't absorb well when I was younger was I had a digestive imbalance that was undiagnosed and got that handled. Now I absorb <laughs> really well. <laughs> so, um, so that's the kind of the secret to weight. There's many different factors to weight. There's the emotional factors. There's the life, the, the choices, there's the movement factor. There's the hormone factor, there's the hidden thyroid factor. And in January, we're going to spend one day, an hour each day going through each one of those pieces. Okay. Setting the stage for if you want to join and do this four month journey together, where we're going to really dive in, run labs, look at what's going on in your body and really help you become the master of your own physical body, physical body in the weight realm. Okay. Now, um, so now, so that's one of the big changes that are happening. Another change that is happening is I spoke to is estradiol is, I remember one day I was driving in my car and I, and there was this young girl walking down, maybe, you know, young ish, thirties, twenties, thirties, walking down the road. And I looked at her and I said, wow, that's really attractive. In other words, there's a tendency to be attracted towards. And I, this light bulb went on and I was like, oh my gosh, of course, that's what estradiol does. Its job is to make us attractive to other, to make baby, right? And I'm not just talking about physical attractive. I'm just talking about, we, we, we need to attract other to make baby for procreation. We're just talking straight straight biology here, right? We're not talking about any anything um, other, you know, not about choice and all of that. I didn't have babies, right? So I made a different choice. But when we, so, so our libido, I mean, gosh, I remember during my younger years, I would hit those fertility years and I was just straight up horny. Like I wanted, you know, now I have always had, well, not always, but most of my adult life had lower hormone levels because of my health challenge, right? So I don't have, I didn't have abundant estrogen and abundant testosterone. And so that's my, been my dance anyway. However, there was this force that did want this procreative element, right? So now we're shifting out of that. Estrone doesn't care if you procreate, which can be super disorienting if you're used to that fire. Because, so when I was sick, I had something called vulvodynia, which is basically, you know, that area feels like it's on fire and, and intercourse is very painful and all that. So I had had to learn how to be intimate in a new way already. But if you're used to that, like fiery, like hot, oh yeah, and you're missing it and you're looking for it and where is it and your husband wants it and all of that, you might not find it. Now, if things are really out of balance in your system, stress shuts down libido. So libido is a really complicated subject because things that drive our libido or shut it down, unrepressed anger, oh my gosh, shuts the libido down in most cases in women. Um, feeling unheard, feeling unmatched, but stress completely just tanks the hormones. I told you this already. So you're not going to have hot, sexy hormones during this time, most likely if you're stressed out and angry at somebody, right? It's just not happening. But it's super important that we realize that men's hormones don't go through this shift. Their testosterone levels don't change to a new type of hormone. And, and now we're talking, of course, heterosexual relationships. But if, if, you know, if we're engaged in that, but they, they, they don't 
keep the same type of hormones, I mean, they don't change to a new type of hormone. So they still have that libido that says procreate. It just might diminish as their testosterone levels go down. And hopefully they're not converting into estrogen, which men can do, which then makes them mooby and flumpy and couch potato-y. And if your husband's experiencing any of that, get him some help because he's converting his testosterone, which is not good. Um, anyway, so our libido goes down. Um, it does, it, it goes down. I shouldn't say it goes down, it changes. Because what becomes important to us in this stage of life is deep understanding, deep connection. So this is a beautiful time for a woman to start to do something like study Tantra, because it's a, it's a lovely time to, um, to start to learn to listen on a deeper, more subtle level then look for that fire. And if we have a partner that's willing to do it with us, all the better. But it's definitely something that we can do on our own without a partner. But what we're looking for is looking for what turns us on now. It's different than what turned us on before, okay? So yes, if your libido is completely gone, you can't orgasm, you can't self-pleasure, you can't do anything. There might be some hormonal stuff going on that is due to maybe a hidden stressor in your body or life stressor or something that can get balanced out. That can be helpful. But just know that it's probably never going to be that same fire because it's not supposed to be. Because our job now is to dive in and to distill what we've learned and offer that back out. And we do that through a communing with self and communing with other, rather than that sort of frenetic, oh, I've got to have and let me do. It's, it's much more about being than having and doing, right? Are you getting the sense that during this time, things like meditation become super, super important? Journaling, quiet time, still space. I understand why people take up bird watching because <laughs> just being in that still space is so valuable during this time, okay? Okay, so I think I'm gonna pause for a minute and just see if there's any big questions that we have at the moment. And then if there's not, we'll dive into the brain health, okay? Now, if you do not, uh, this is being recorded. I will be placing this recording on the Wise Woman Facebook group. It's a private group just for women. But if you don't want your, you, you want to ask a question, but you don't want your face shown or something like that, then just turn your camera off. That's fine. Um, and then you guys will get a link to join that group so you can get a copy of it. So let me, um, who do we got? Uh, who wants, to, oh, Lauren, you have a question. Sure, go ahead. I just put in the chat, I was curious about if you have like an overall kind of brain fog a little bit and you lose your, your motivation and your drive in general that you're used to having, um, which I'm really, really struggling with. It's getting in the way of everything I'm trying to do. And I'm in a lot of transition right now. And it's just very challenging and frustrating. Um, Okay, so we'll talk about brains our next one. So I, I'll dive into that in our next one. I just want to, I wanted to see if anybody had a question about the last two because our brain is changing. So we don't remember quite as much Lauren and then I promise I'll answer that. Anybody okay, else have any questions about the weight piece? I see somebody about a loss of muscle mass. So that loss of muscle mass comes from two things. One from not using it. Um, you know, this thing. I started getting it and all I started doing was I started doing this thing called the Tibetan rites and you see, it's not, it's not, it's not there. <laughs> you got to use them. Okay. So you got to do arm stuff. Number one, number two, a low testosterone will lose, uh, will inhibit muscle gain. Um, so that's also, I'm looking at some of the, uh, the things, you know, don't worry. We will get to the brain. Uh, glad to see you're here, Jody. Um, so what was the other one? Concerned about our, yes, of course, and the risk of, of breast cancer. Uh, first of all, I don't believe anybody should ever be on synthetic estrogen ever, um, of, of any kind, ever. I can't think of a reason anyway. Someone can educate me as to why I, that statement is incorrect. I'm open to it, but the, the bioidentical um, is, uh, 
so much better than uh, the than any of the any any of the synthetic hormones. They have terrible side effects. Carrie, I have a question about weight um, yeah. before we move on real quick. So um, before you know, I'm a very active person and before um, I would, you know, cardio, cross train, all of this stuff. And now that I'm in full blown menopause, because I just had this total hysterectomy with the ovaries taken out, I, um, and of course the weight's all there and my body's not responding the way it did before. Um, I've heard that I probably shouldn't do those high intense interval things that would add stress to my body versus like something more gentle, like a swim or a uh, gentle yoga. What do you think about that? So my, my rule for not activating the adrenals is you exercise till you feel good, not till you feel tired and you're not pushing for the adrenal, the, uh, the, um, the, the hormone rush, right? You don't want to exercise till you're like, ah, you're on that high because that's just because a bunch of um, hormones have been released into your stress hormones have been released into your brain. So yes, regular, moderate exercise, absolutely better than, you know, running a marathon or, you know, training for a triathlon at this phase of life. Anything that upregulates stress, upregulates stress. I went to a detox camp that was supposed to be healthy for you and it upregulated stress in my body and threw me completely off. So exercising in a way that is balanced is far better. But that doesn't mean you can't get your heart rate up and you can't do a, a run or whatever it is that you are, are a good yoga, strong yoga class. You don't have, you don't want to become sedentary either, but we don't want to do that high, super hard push, push, push intensity stuff anymore. Okay. No, I don't believe that's good for us. Okay. Let me look at some of these, uh, these comments here. Did you have anything else with that? Vanessa, was that good? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. So. Okay, so somebody wants to know uh, to practice for libido, what are the RM exercises? R I don't know what RM means. If you could just clarify what you mean by RM exercises. Oh, the exercises, hmm. The, I'm not sure about that question, Charlene, if you wanna clarify. So instead of uh, HRT, what do I recommend? I recommend that a person dives into all the various sources of where there is stress in your body and why it is there. And you balance that out. When your body is balanced out, when you don't have latent infections in it, you can do things like use uh, you know, compounds that have wild yam in them and they will help. You can boost your adrenals and it will help. You cannot uh, do that, though, if you've got latent gut infections or urinary tract infections or or lingering mono or things that I see in women a lot that at this time of life are really wreaking havoc on their system. So you have to go more global and then you're able to take the things and they will actually help. If you don't go more global, then you will you won't be able to take the stuff that normally helps. It, it, it'll make you feel worse. OK. Um, yes, vaginal atrophy and painful sex. Absolutely, a, a real deal. So one of the things that I use, I've used throughout, I used when I had vulvodynia was coconut oil. Make sure it is unrefined. Um, vaginal atrophy, you don't use it, you lose it. So you gotta be using that thing. Um, and and painful sex. So there is a, uh, Bez Wecken makes some suppositories. Uh, there are ones with no hormone. There's ones with a little bit of estriol in it. Estriol is bo considered bone protective and does not carry any of the dangerous quote unquote side effects that, that are associated with um, estradiol. Um, that also can really help people, but start with the coconut oil. Most partners like the coconut oil and see if that's enough for you. Um, there are people that specialize in that if you have a really acute case. Um, and Jeannie, uh, I don't know what area you're in. The person I refer people to are in the LA area. So if you need a referral, you can reach out to me and I can give you that. Um, what about things like Amber Barron? Is uh, Amber Barron, is that, I don't, I'm not familiar with that. Is that the, um, somebody want to come on and, and remind me what Amber Barron is? Amber, it's, it's called Amberin. It's like, oh. um, it's like, um, 
it's for the sim treating symptoms of menopause. I, I bought it at Costco. I, it's, oh, okay. it's like, okay. it's actually like, um, like I think it might be herbal based. There's no drugs in it or anything like that. It's okay. just supposed to help with menopause. Symptoms. You know, I, quite truthfully, thank you Vivian, for coming on. I was thinking yeah. that maybe it was some sort of, you know, treat, they got some different treatments for, for the vaginal region. <laughs> I was like, maybe it was one of them. Um, anyway, in general, I would not trust uh, supplements that are bought, uh, bought from Costco. They, um, you know, the research just shows when they test them, they don't have much in them. And it really depends on what's in there and also what's going on with the individual. It can, you know, it can help. Some people might and other people might not. It really is an individual um, and it really is an individual thing. Part of what we're going to do in January in this class that is focused on, on, on the physical uh, weight aspect, we are going to be running, ha having you run labs on yourself. And we'll be going over those labs to help you figure out what's going on in your body and what is driving some of the imbalances. So um, that is something that we're going to be doing in the meantime. I mean, you know, Vivian, you know how I work. So um, you know, we can dive in if you, if you want to, or you can just look around your life and look at where you think you're off, um, and what might be, uh, driving you, uh, to feel imbalanced. Um, so what age is this phase of life, uh, is asked, you know, I, I had somebody the other day, she has all the symptoms of it and she's 40 years old. That to me is too young. And, um, and in uh, most likely we will be able to hopefully balance your system back out and get it back online. Um, it's better if we, you know, the body uh, stays out of menopause longer. Um, so uh, the, um, so the, sorry, I, I was multitasking. <laughs> I shouldn't do that. So um, what was I saying? Somebody help me. <laughs> Where was I? I got I got stuck on a question. Age, <laughs> the age of the. Oh yeah. yeah. So it can be. So you are in. You're going through the transition in your forties. I did not stop having irregular periods until I was fifty four. Okay, so irregularity of period has nothing to do with the change. Um, so a woman can start in her, like I said, early forties, or and and. Some women, they don't really start noticing things until, you know, 49, 50. And some women never notice anything. They just stop bleeding one day. Like I said, it doesn't have to be kooky crazy. But if it is, then there's stuff that you can do. Okay. So um, the, the, the question that uh, Charlene had was about what arm exercises. I'm doing something called the five Tibetan rites. Um, which basically are kind of these yoga things, but yeah, I always love yoga. It calms you down. It strengthens your body. It strengthens your arms. It inverts. It, it strengthens the brain. Um, and I said for yo for, for libido, I said Tantra. Um, the Tantra is what I recommend that you, you do. Okay, I'm going to peek down and then I'm going to get on to the next one. Uh, I think black cohosh can be beautiful, Kim. Um, and it only will work if a body isn't, doesn't have immune challenges, but it can be a really nice balancer. Sage tea, if you're getting a uh, hot sweats or night sweats is also really lovely to help calm that down. You can't do it. You don't want to do it really, really long-term, but if you're having a particularly sweaty period, some sage tea can, can calm things down. Um, yeah, the Tibetan practices. Thank you, Tammy. Um, can maybe Kari can show us? Yeah, not on this video. <laughs> it's a whole like thing. Yeah, I'd have to nah. But maybe I'll I, I can send a link to somebody who does who does them. It's a man, but anyway. Um, okay, now let's get to brain. Okay. And get me back to everyone. There we go. I'm going to stop looking at chat because it's distracting. So let's get to brain. So what's happening with our brain during this time? Um, when you have low estrogen levels in your body, which during this transition you can have periods of, you will uh, your brain health does suffer. They will show that. You can re go online and read all the terrible things that happen to your body when you have low estrogen. And the problem with that is that it makes it into a pathology. And the solution thereby is either suffer or estrogen replacement. And 
no one's talking about estrone and that that's the form of estrogen that's supposed to be dominant now and that you can do something to get that online which is get your stress levels in your physical body and in your emotional body regulated okay so the brain needs glucose so intermittent fasting is one of the worst things you can do for your brain Okay, unless again, if you're doing a ketogenic diet, and if you're doing a ketogenic diet, I recommend that you really do it either with somebody or you really, really do it because going in and out of ketosis, very stressful on the body. And again, we're all about doing nothing that is highly stressful on the body. That doesn't mean that we can't have some stressors, everything in life can be a stressor. It just it doesn't mean like I literally like quit quit my practice and moved into a tent in Hawaii, trying to regulate stress and it didn't work right. Um, but, but, but we do want to not be doing things that are triggering stress, like over exercising or eating in erratic ways. Right. So, um, so we want to, so it needs glucose, regular glucose, uh, to the brain. Super, super important. Why not enough glucose brain cells die straight up. Okay. Body can't get enough glucose. It puts us into a stress state. It needs exercise you've got to be moving because you got to get blood to your brain that's why i love yoga because it inverts so much and all that blood gets up into your brain we got to be circulating your spinal fluid does not have a pump the pump is movement if we're sitting around all day that spinal fluid is pooling at your low back not exchanging nutrients and then we start ending up with degenerative discs and brains that aren't working well right so we've got to be moving it's super, super important for brain health. Now, we have to be um, eating the nutrients that our brain needs. So what does our brain need? It needs protein. Every day, you've got a protein pool in your body that has to be replaced every single day. If you don't replace that pool every single day, then you are running into a deficit. When we're in a deficit of protein, we actually uh, can't make the the neurotrans, I'm not the neurotransmitter, excuse me, the enzymes we need that drive every function in the body. Okay. So when we're low in protein, we are um, going into little blackouts where the body has to pick and choose what it uses its enzymes for. So you got to be getting your protein every day. So if you're vegetarian, fine, great. Be smart about it. Make sure your digestive tract is working. You're getting your protein. If you are a meat eater, you want to eat really high quality meats. Why? Because the, I know it all gets so tricky, doesn't it? Um, because the, the toxins are in the fat of meat. And if you're eating meat that's been raised in commercial ways, you're getting all those toxins in the fat. That's really not healthy for us. Plus meats have naturally occurring omega-3s, but when they're raised poorly, those omega-3s turn into omega-6s. Omega-6s create inflammation. Lauren, brain fog is brain inflammation. Straight up, something's inflaming the brain. Either it's you know not getting enough um, uh, nutrients or it's got toxins in there or there's a food intolerance, something is inflaming the brain. That's what causes brain fog. I went away uh, to an event and they were labeling the food and none of the food looked like it had soy in it. And so I was eating it and I don't do well with soy, but I knew I'd gotten a little and I was doing okay. And I thought, oh, great, I'm doing good. And then the next day, the, the person who, who was coordinating the event got them to really label the food and every single food item they put out had soy in it. So I had been eating massive amounts of soy. That next week, I was like, losing words and like my brain was not I was go I felt like I was back in my Lyme disease disease days and then now it's come back online but you got brain fog there is something that is inflaming your brain and the problem with that is okay. that leads to brain degeneration yeah okay and that 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 is including the lack of drive and lack of sure um, motivation as well yeah Absolutely. You also can have an under converting thyroid that can lead to all of those symptoms as well. We've got high stress levels. The body down regulates the thyroid that can be leading to it. Um, a lot. I see a lot of women in this time of life that they're under converting uh, their T4 to T3 and doctors aren't looking at that. So it's going undiagnosed. Um, plus, if we're on estrogen of any kind, that blocks the conversion of T4 to T3. T3 is the active form of thyroid. So we start putting on weight, losing hair, our skin starts drying out. We start getting oogly's. You know, when you start seeing cellulite on your ribs, you're like, what is going on? 
under converting thyroid. Um, so I've been tested a whole bunch and my, of course, my thyroid keeps coming back normal, but like you said, it could be going undiagnosed. What can I do to, um, you know, combat what I'm dealing with? Well, you've got, there needs to be more sleuthing. If it's not the thyroid, then you've got maybe a food intolerance, maybe doing a food panel to see if you're eating something that's inflaming the brain. Maybe there's an immune challenge in your system that's inflaming the brain. Maybe there's a, you know, undiagnosed SIBO or some kind of gut imbalance that's inflaming the brain, but something is creating that brain inflammation. And you've got, you really want to dig, dive in more deeply and figure out what it is because it's super important, obviously, without our brain. I went, I had Lyme disease, right? So Lyme disease, mold, and SIBO simultaneously, my brain function, thank God I had a lot of brain cells, was really challenged for a period of time. And um, and so I value my brain health. I, you know, if I'm a, I'm a intolerant to gluten, if I eat it, I get brain inflammation. And that would be one that you might really want to you know, check out, I don't know if you have, but that, it, that intolerance to gluten can complete, can create anxiety. It can create brain fog. It can create, um, uh, memory issues. It can create depression. It can create lethargy, all of that. So, um, so brain health, uh, people want to know, like, what are the, so anything specific what you're telling us, what did you work for you? Yeah, okay. So, um, Yes, hair dyes can contribute uh, chemicals. That's another big one in during this time, ladies, is really look up xenoestrogens and get them out of your hair skincare products. Um, super, super important. They throw off your whole hormonal system um, and uh, we don't need to be putting this stuff. The average woman used to put like 95 chemicals on. I say used to because since COVID, it's probably more because we're all, everybody's sanitizing everything, but 95 chemicals on their body before they walked out of the house those chemicals go in and act as xenoestrogens. They turn estrogen on, which then causes you to be in a relative progesterone to estrogen um, imbalance, which is actually promotes all kinds of health issues like you know cancers and such. We really wanna have a good balance of progesterone to estrogen and um, xenoestrogens are really contributing to that. So, um, somebody was asking, what did I do for me? What, what worked for me? I went about, this is what I did. So when I thought my brain was degenerating and I thought I had potentially, and doctors had said this to me, potentially um, uh, uh, MLS, I, um, I just did that backwards. Anyway, I um, just sat down and I said, what would I do differently in my life? if I had the diagnosis and I made those changes and I just kept making the choice because when I was looking at something where I would not survive, right. Or, you know, would completely degenerate my quality of life. I was looking at what was, what was more important than that. And so I just was willing to make the choices that I needed to make to live a lifestyle that supported me in my health. Does that make sense? And so a lot of what's going on for us at this point is we've been in this over push and this over give and this overdrive for too long. And now we are um, in this imbalance. And so if you've been living a balanced lifestyle, but you're still feeling like you're, you're out of balance and stressed out, the thing that's driving the imbalance is inside. It's your subconscious. It's your psyche. Maybe not your choices. Maybe it's not that you're running around like a crazy person, but maybe it is. This is kind of the the, the, this time is kind of the, the, the like soothsayer. It's like, we don't get to get away with it anymore. It's calling us back. It's calling us back home. So what are the things that you can take away from this? I know I said a lot, right? The first thing I want you to take away is that this transition can be bumpy, but it's not, it's not bad and it's not wrong. It's, it's us just learning to be a new way. Yeah? Take, remember that some of the ups and downs, if you're still cycling, is whether or not you 
produced an egg that month. And if you wanna know that, you can get a fertility monitor that can help you. Because if you didn't produce an egg that month, then that month, that cycle might be more bumpy. Yeah. Um, remember the importance of moving your body. You cannot be sedentary. Your brain needs you to move. The couple of things on the brain that I didn't say, I talked about protein. You also need healthy fats. You need, you know, good quality fish oils. Uh, walnuts are, are good omega-3s. Uh, my, one of the things I'm loving right now is, which is a good source of omega-3s, our chia seed pudding I make with coconut milk and chia seeds. And then I just take a bite here and there as a snack, high, high in protein, high in fat, gives me a little bit of a blood sugar evenness and gives me some more omega-3s. Um, making sure if we're taking fish oils that they're coming from really good quality sources, please do not buy your fish oils from Costco. I have seen even prescription fish oils from doctors elevating mercury levels in, in pregnant women. It's horrifying to me. So fish oils are also helpful for the brain. Regulating the blood sugar is helpful for all aspects of it. And then identifying whether you have any food intolerances, um, whether you have any latent infections in your system. Yeah. And then when you, when you are, when your life isn't working in balance and you know it, but you can't get yourself to change anything, then you've got to dive in and see who's the one that's, that's driving your choice. And most likely it is a survival program from when you were younger that said, if I don't behave this way, I'm not going to survive. I'm not going to be loved. I'm not going to be taken care of. Those survival programs will lead us into, at this phase, really, really imbalanced places. It's really time for us to move out of survival and into a deeper level of connection and trust. Yeah. So deep breath in, <laughs> I said a lot. And I want you all to know that I feel better now at 56 than I did at 47. I feel better, better now at 56 because of my health journey than I did in my 30s. And it was bumpy for a little while there. It was absolutely bumpy for a little while. So if you're gonna do a hormone replacement, only do bioidentical. If you're gonna do hormone replacement, make the goal to do as little as possible. And if a little bit isn't balancing out your symptoms, then look at where the stress is coming from in your body that is driving it. I, 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 when I was getting my doctorate, I followed around this gynecologist, very, very successful man. And he, he admitted to me that at one point he had a woman on 840 milligrams of estrogen. We take like one milligram or two. I mean, like we take these tiny amounts and um, to try to control our hot flashes. And that's, he wasn't using bioidentical. So that's just straight up dangerous, right? If your hot flashes aren't going away, there's something else driving it. Very often I find that has to do with um, an infection in the body. That's 99% of the time. On, on the last one of these calls I get, there was a woman on the call. She was having terrible hot flashes. Afterwards, she came and saw me. She had a, a parasite. We got rid of the parasite and within a very short amount of time, her hot flashes were back to normal. So very often there's a latent immune challenge that is driving it, okay? So take lots of deep breaths and remember one of the things that changes, cause I see a lot of mommies here with younger kids. One of the things that changes during this time is our need to give to others lessons. We wanna give, but we wanna do it in a different way. So if you're a mom and you've got young kids and you just aren't enjoying putting them to bed as much, still put them to bed, but don't judge yourself because of it. It's just the hormones that's shifting, okay? If you don't want, my girlfriend reached out to me the other day and she's like, oh my God, I don't wanna make another lunch. I'm like, make his lunch, he's seven, or help get him to help you make his lunch. But, <laughs> you know, it is shifting, it will shift. Our desire to take care of others goes down. And that's part of it. And that's why this time can be so amazing because we don't have to serve everybody else anymore. Now, interestingly, as we get freed hormonally from serving everybody else, our desire to serve in a bigger way comes on even strong, more strongly, which is beautiful, right? 
but it's learning to navigate that balance. Same in our relationships. We may not want to take care of our partners in the same way that we used to. That's very disorienting. So if you can explain to your partner what's going on, then they will be maybe more tolerant to understand more, you know, but we are shifting. We are becoming different beings. Now I have gone over and you guys have stayed with me. So I know that there might be a few more questions. So what I will be willing to do, those of you that need to go, you know, thank you so much for showing up today. I will put this recording in the Facebook group. I will send you out an invite to that Facebook group. So you can re-listen to it, especially if you, you know, you, you weren't there. If you want to share it with a friend, just get them to jump in the Facebook group as long as they meet the demographics. And I will stay a little bit to answer any of the questions because I know I, I went over and didn't answer questions about the brain health so much. So, you know, I'm going to actually say one thing about the brain health that I did. I just realized I didn't say your brain is changing. So multitasking, I, I said this a little bit, but know that the way your memory chain is working is changing. So you're not going to probably, some people can still, but I can't, I can't do it the same way. That's why you saw me get lost while I was reading this. And then I forgot what I was saying. I didn't used to be that way. <laughs> I used to be able to do 12 things at once, but your brain is literally changing, which is giving us the ability to be more focused and one pointed, which is beautiful. And it can be disorienting. So you're not going crazy. You're not getting Alzheimer's, you're not doing all that. You just have to learn how to navigate this new brain. Yeah. And if you go online and read about it, they'll tell you that the incidence goes up, but not if you're balanced. Okay, so does anybody have a question before I sign off for today? Oh, that's very sweet. Thank you, Vivian. Yeah. Hi. Hi. You wanna do you have a question or are you just saying goodbye? Oh, there you go. No, no, I was just, I just wrote it. I was just asking, can you diagnose the stressors or latent infections from afar online? So I'm working online. Yeah, I know you're in another country. I do have people in, uh, in other countries that I work with. It, we, you know, we navigate like how you find supplements and all that kind of stuff. But yes, definitely. I've got, I've got one in Helsinki right now. I got one in Fr South France, got one in Germany. So absolutely. And congratulations. I can't wait to hear about that. <laughs> exciting. <laughs> Yeah. Are there any other questions for me? Ladies, thank you so much for showing up. November, hormone replacement therapy and how to navigate the holidays during this time. Super important, right? Because there's so many triggers that come at us. We'll talk a little bit more about outdated survival programming, what you do with it when you need it, all that kind of stuff. So watch out for that and um, watch out for the, the replay join the Facebook group. I'll be going live on there and we're just going to continue this dialogue and make sure that we get you guys supported. Okay. Sending you all so, so, so much love. Bye.